Greetings, I'm John Duvall. Welcome to the Truth Factor Discussion. It's good to have you with us today, and we appreciate your interest in factoring the truth into our and your daily lives. It's so good to have you with us today. Uh, we uh, so apologize for the extreme delay in beginning. We had some technical issues. The primary holdup was me. I came in this morning, my webcam says, you know, I'm not going to work anymore and I uh, worked with it, fiddled with it, put in a substitute or a backup webcam that had had some flaky issues and it remained flaky issues. So I have stepped over to our adult classroom and as a result you won't see me coming to you in the highly defined high definition, I'll just be in standard definition. But my two partners in Bible study, they're coming to you in high definition. Good morning gentlemen, how are you all doing today? Paul, let's start with you. Doing very well, John, and uh, I do appreciate everyone's patience with us. Sometimes we have to work through a few things, and we've determined that today we're going to go ahead, even though we're starting about 15 minutes late, we're just going to make it a 45-minute Bible study, not uh, run past the top of the hour. And so we're glad that you're with us. We see that we have uh, Brian Haynes and a couple of viewers with us. If you wanted to sign in, that will allow you to participate in our study. Just click Guest and type your name and then it'll let you ask questions or make comments in the chat as we study today in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And so uh, I'll pass off now to Tom. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning out here in California, at least. It's, it's good to be a part of the study. As always, welcome to those who are studying with us live, as well as those of you who may view this at some later date. Um, it, it is our hope that as we study God's Word that we strive to be true to the message and uh, make application in our lives, factor the truth into our lives as is the name of uh, this particular program here. So uh, it's uh, about time for us to get started here. So uh, back to you, John. Thank you, Tom. Um, hopefully you haven't had any problems navigating the new website. Um, completely reworked the website, kind of transferring it to a WordPress blog, a, a backbone a type setting. And I've tried to make the pages look as close to possible as far as where the location of the buttons were as were on the previous look. If you're looking at a live discussion page that has, uh, let's say, a graphic up there that says on our next Truth Factor discussion, uh, and it gives the date for it, and it's just a graphic, you need to refresh the page, and it should load in the updated page. But I did this morning update the, update the embed code uh, on both the old page and the new page, so just in case your browser still had uh, in, um, in just case your browser was wanting to take you to the old one. But if you have any issues, just let me know in the chat room. Of course, if you are having issues, that means you can't hear what I'm saying, so what I said probably didn't mean anything, did it, gentlemen? <laughs> Until later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll catch it on on the replay. All right. Well, let's pick up where we step where we le um, start left off last week. And as Paul said, we won't hold you over. This is a uh, delay on our end, and we're going to keep our study to about a, a forty minute study now. Uh, looking at the clock here. Thank you for joining us. If you're in the chat room today, thank you so much. Please uh, feel free to participate with your comments and questions, and we'll bring them onto the screen as well. All right, gentlemen. Let's continue our reading from First Corinthians chapter eight. Let's start in verse 7, and after we read from 7 to the end of the chapter, uh, I'm sorry, not the end of the chapter, let's start in verse 7 and read down through verse, yeah, I'm sorry, let's go to the end of the chapter, and that'll help bring the context back in, and we'll do a brief review of where we were at last week. Uh, Paul, would you mind reading that for us? Be happy to do that, John, and if we're going to be reading in... Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, beginning at verse 7. Uh, when we read there, uh, the scripture says, However, there is not in everyone that knowledge, for some, with consciousness of the idol, until now eat it as a thing offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. But food does not commend us to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, nor if we do not eat are we the worse. But beware lest somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, 
Will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? And because of your knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when you thus sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat. I will never again eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. All right, thank you, Paul. Let's step back up now in the text there to verse seven, where we began. And if you're wondering what I'm looking at, I'm having to look at the overhead projector. And that's right over here because that's what's displaying the verse for me to see. And so it's a little bit off kelter there a little bit. All right, is Paul's point to justify the eating of meats offered to idols? Or do you think his point is more about caring for one another and taking into thought the, um, the spiritual condition and knowledge of one another? Well, I, I think absolutely he's dealing with the latter observation, the way that we treat each other, because, I mean, he's already, he's already indicated earlier in this chapter that meat is nothing. You know, the meat offered to idols, it's, it's, it's meat. I mean, when you offer it to an idol, you're offering it to a rock. You're offering it to a carved image or a molded image that's worthless. I mean, it it has zero power whatsoever. The the only the only challenge to it is the sin that is involved in worshiping that object over God, and uh, that's what would cause those who were converted out of idolatry into Christianity to. Uh, to have a problem with it sometimes, and uh, that's the challenge that Paul's dealing with. Conscience. Uh, we need to care about. We need to care about how our actions affect our brethren. However, in so doing, we need to make sure that we understand what it means to offend them. And I believe last week, as we concluded the study, we said we we're going to talk a little bit about that. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Um, Paul, one of the things we looked at last week, and I think Brian uh, had some good comments in the chat room last week when we were talking about this, is that it wasn't that the knowledge was not present. It's that in some of these, these younger Christians or newer converts, um, it was the lack of application of this truth that Paul reveals here that was kind of creating the, the issue that needed to be dealt with. Yes, as I remember, uh, John, uh, and I am drawing on memory here, but I believe it was Brian who brought a point to our uh, attention that was said basically that if this was just a problem that they needed instruction about meats offered to idols, Paul would have provided that instruction. Uh, but rather, this was a problem of them not uh, thinking about and being aware of a brother who, uh, here it says that, uh, it, bother, it, it bothers his conscience, I guess I should say. It, not just that it bothers him, but it bothers his conscience to eat something that had previously been offered to an idol. And so in doing that, if he sees you doing that, or if you encourage him to do that, that that would cause him to sin, because whatever is not of faith is sin. Right. Uh, not necessarily something that uh, you could reason it out with him and, and rationalize it and say, uh, reason from the scriptures even and just say don't you understand that this isn't anything and he might say sure I get that it's not anything but it just uh, I feel guilty when I would eat of this thing and so I'm just not going to do it and so we need to be sensitive to people who uh, that their conscience won't allow them to do something that we feel like we have the liberty to do and so uh, to be sensitive about how other people how our actions impact other people. Right, exactly, yeah. And and Tom brought up a point we'll talk about here in a little bit about some abuses from this passage there. Um, observe there in verse 7 where he makes the point that you have some who, with consciousness of the idol, eat it as a thing offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Although they've been converted from the faith, because of their lifelong practice of, 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 of eating this meat or this meat product while in worship to idols, it's hard for them to disassociate that practice. And therefore, in their mind, if they're eating this meat at the dinner table that had been offered to the idol and then sold at the market, 
they just can't get past that and they believe that they are eating it as if it is being offered to an idol and therefore they're guilty in their mind of sin. Uh, Paul brought up the point there from Romans chapter 14, I believe it is, where the Apostle Paul says that uh, he concludes by saying whatever is not of faith is of sin. And in that context there, he's not, you know, you can't use that verse in saying, well, the Bible doesn't say that we can use instrumental music, and if you do it, it's not of faith, therefore it's sin. Um, while it's true that instrumental music is, uh, exceeds the authority of scriptures and is wrong, in the context of Romans 14, that's talking about doing something that you believe to be wrong, even though it's not wrong. If you believe it's wrong, then you must not do it. And that's kind of kind of the, the point here that's being contended with. So he says there in verse 8, But food does not commend us to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, nor if we do not eat are we the worse. I mean, I can either have ice cream with butterscotch chips and M&Ms and Reese's Pieces and chocolate syrup and then caramel syrup, or I can have an apple. Either way. Neither will commend me to God, neither will set me against God. But this liberty that I have, or this liberty that we have that Paul talks about, becomes a stumbling block to someone who is weak, weak in knowledge, weak in conscience and understanding. Um, any, any thoughts or comments? Yeah, uh, you know, I, I, I want to make an observation, an application, I guess I should say to this today. You know, living in America... At the moment, we don't deal with idolatry the way that they did back in Roman Greece. And the reason I say at the moment, who knows, who knows what the future is going to hold? We we have more and more people that are wanting to worship things. And when I say things, I'm not just talking about materialism, covetousness. I'm talking about they want to worship rocks and trees, and more. That's happening more and more. But the point that he is making. I believe has some very valid application. There are people today that struggle with all different types of circumstances, you know, addictions. Uh, you have these substance addictions, the alcohol, alcohol, drugs, those types of things, but you also have the behavioral addictions, what, whatever, that, whatever that might be, uh, gambling, the, the sexual addictions, pornography, and all those types of things. And one of the things that people are taught to do, or one of the things that they have to do if they're caught up in that type of an environment, is they have to avoid the circumstances that lead to temptation. So, you know, somebody's recovering from alcohol, he doesn't need to be going into a bar. You know, not that anybody as a Christian needs to be going into, uh, you know, to a bar per se, but the point is, is you avoid those places. Somebody that's a gambler does not need to schedule his vacations in Las Vegas, <laughs> you know, uh, where the temptations are there. And so, you know, I, I tie that to this here as far as being concerned about the conscience of a weak brother and, and realizing that you have these people that were in idolatry. And it very much means something to them, uh, you know, as their past. And uh, they see the harm that is done in their life, the damage that is done. And they don't want anything to do with it, and that's where we, who were raised all our life, never, never worshiping a rock or a whatever, we need to not be so critical of them for their not being able to go to those places or do those things. And, and I just say that because sometimes we have brethren that become very judgmental of others you know, w without thinking about their background, and, and they do it based on, uh, or they do it when they have, for lack of a better term, ideal circumstances where that particular problem is involved. Okay, all right. It is interesting, some of the examples that you were giving did involve, would have involved sin, you know, someone, yes. a recovering addict. In this case in point, it's not so much the eating of meat that was sin, it was the eating it with the intent of worshiping. Right. right. Yeah, yeah, but the idolatry, yeah, uh, the idolatry is sin. Yeah, but what I'm saying is like, it's like in, in the illustration you use of like drinking, yeah. uh, one might try to say, well, it's okay to drink then as long as you're not in a bar setting. Yeah, right, yeah. That's not, 
That's all I was saying. I'm clearly not saying that. (laughs) No, no, no. No, I know know you wouldn't. (laughs) Yeah, I know you are. But but you do live in California, so I don't know. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Wonderful people out there in some parts of it for sure. (laughs) Um, Okay, the point, look at verse 9. And Paul, I'm, I'm gonna switch this back over to this. To no, I won't. Um, we'll have a we have a couple of comments in chat room. We'll get to here in just a moment. In verse nine, here's the warning. It's interesting. The warning is not issued to the weaker brother. And by the way, I'm I'm of the persuasion that that the weak brother is weak in application of knowledge and understanding, not necessarily weak in the faith. You know, we might think of a weak brother who struggles with sin, who comes, who who misses services, who's late to services, but I don't think that's what he's talking about here. I think the application of it would be weak in, in knowledge and understanding in this particular area, and therefore his conscience is, is weak. Um, so the, the warning is, but beware lest somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. Uh, now, Brian brings an interesting comment to the chat room I want to bring in here in just a couple of minutes. Um, but before we do that, notice the warning here. It may, I may have a liberty that I can engage in, meaning the Bible doesn't say anything about it. It's completely fine. I can do this. But if a brother feels it to be wrong, and as Paul later explains, he, seeing me do it, feels emboldened to do the same thing, then he ends up sinning. When he says here in verse 9 in the New King James, become a stumbling block to those who are weak, when you do a study of the, the, the word stumbling and, and, see, and you see that reference in the scriptures, it's not the accidental trip over a curb and you recover. It is the idea of falling. And so we're talking about a brother in Christ who becomes guilty of sin because he violates his conscience, he does something, and it's not so much that God looks upon him and finds him as guilty, although I think that there is an accountability there, but within his own heart, he has found himself guilty for doing something that he believed to be wrong, and we become guilty before God if we knowingly do this to a brother. Do you think that that's a fair assessment, Paul? I do, and I was thinking about what you were saying, that uh, you know, of course, we're dealing with matters that aren't uh, in and of themselves sinful or not sinful, but it seems like there can be an awful lot of sin that enters in here. There can be the brother who is stirred up to do something, uh, and then he uh, does have guilt after that, and so uh, we see sin entering in. We also see that when you live in such a way that you are disregarding the conscience of a brother uh, he says you sin against it, and you sin against Christ. Yeah. And so uh, the issues themselves, uh, we could make a very clear point that he's not dealing with right and wrong, but he is dealing with sin that comes in based upon uh, how we behave uh, in those situations. Yeah. And, and, such, and such a blow to a, a, a member like that, our brother, could lead to his perishing, as we see there in verse 11. You know, because of your knowledge shall the weak brother perish. Which means, and, and it begs the question, does he mean perish in hell fire because of sin, or perish in that he falls from the Lord because he has done something that he believes to be so wrong that it's irrecoverable or unrecoverable? And I, I don't know, that's just a thought there, and I probably shouldn't have said that out loud. <laughs> the result is the same. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I think the result is the same. You know, if, if somebody, if somebody is caught up in, uh, again, there's things that they have doubt about, and if, as a result of the stronger brother, as uh, you know, defining it in this context here, causes them to stumble, they may reach a point of discouragement, to where they say, "What's the use? Yeah, and give up," and their soul obviously is in danger yeah. at that point unless they make it right. You know, I, uh, yeah. you know we, we mentioned the Romans 14. One of the points that Paul makes there in verse number 15 of Romans 14, he says, if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do right, not right. destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. We, you know, how often in Scripture is it emphasized that we need to love each other as brethren? 
and that really needs to be a, a fundamental factor behind uh, the way we treat each other, and and sometimes that's lacking. Yeah, and that's and and that's a good reminder what you brought up Romans fourteen because I don't want to suggest that we're not guilty of sin if we violate our conscience. Yeah, um, but Romans fourteen, if you know whatever's not of faith is sin. Sin is to miss the mark, and if we do something we believe it's to be wrong, uh, then we violate our conscience. We we have missed that mark, and we right. we stand guilty. Yeah, yeah exactly. And but but the warning here is against those who would would uh, lay this burden upon a brother. Exactly. And lead him into that needlessly. Yeah. Uh, Paul, do you think now would be a good time to bring in Brian's comment? Do you think we've pretty well covered the last portion of chapter eight? I would agree with that, and I think we do need to bring in uh, Brian's. Uh, I think Brian's dealing one with a comment that uh, is outstanding right now. Yeah, and what we're going to look at that, and then after we catch up with the chat room, let's come back and then talk about how this passage has been abused. Yes. Sound good? Mm -hmm. Sounds good. All right, here comes the chat room. Uh, Brian said, uh, did Paul, uh, and he's speaking of the apostle there, desire this mindfulness to extend to the unbeliever? He says, I would say no, because I do not see it as possible to have a sympathy uh, to an unbeliever, but I would like to know if there is another option. And he defines sympathy there as like-mindedness. Uh, we're, we're, I would agree with you, Brian, there, that we're not operating on the same basis when we're talking about someone who's not a Christian. And so... Uh, they're not. Um, we we don't have. First of all, we don't have that responsibility. But we do want to treat all people with respect. And, and I don't think any of us would disagree with that. But what he's talking about here is specifically uh, a brother who you could cause to sin, you could cause him to fall away, uh, you could uh, wound his weak conscience. And so uh, that I think in the context we'd just leave it right there. What it is that he's speaking of. Uh, brothers and sisters in Christ and how they interact with one another. Right. Clear, and, and, and I clearly agree with that. The one observation I would make, though, is we know that it, it, it is emphasized in Scripture that we are to be an example to those who are unbelievers. Uh, you know, that's how, that's how you lead them to Christ. So if you're looking at a circumstance where when you're buying, you know, look at the example, when you're buying meat in the market and you somehow leave the impression with the unbelievers that you're approving of their idolatry. That might be something to think about. You know, um, but but, but, I, but I I definitely agree that this context is clearly dealing with brethren and and uh, our standard. I hesitate to say this, but uh, I'm going to. <laughs> Our standard with brethren is different than it is with those of the world. You know, God dictated that. The way we treat our brethren is different. Well, it kind of, okay, here, here's kind of the application of that. Let's say that your physical family, your wife's brother, is a Islam. Islam. Okay. Muslim. Yeah, a, a Muslim. Thank you. And he feels like, and I don't know enough about their their belief to to be able to to make an accurate guess. But let's say he views that eating a particular meat is wrong. The question is, when you invite your in-laws over to the house, are you prevented? from serving that which you know he will not eat, and if he does, his conscience will be offended. Are you prevented by scripture, or in that case, just common courtesy? And I, I agree with, with what Brian was saying. In that case, in point, since he's not a brother in Christ, the responsibility, the responsibility towards him is not the same as it is towards your brother in Christ. But yet there is a matter of common courtesy, you know, that we John, can talk about. I would agree with you that when we apply this passage or we apply the Romans 14 passage, it's not dealing with people who are not Christians, but uh, it would be wrong of us to 
behave toward anyone yeah. uh, in a way that's unkind or unloving, and to do that Good would point. would I believe it would be wrong to do, but yeah. not because it violates First Corinthians eight or Romans fourteen, but because it is uh, showing an unloving and unkind spirit, uh, yeah. which is not you know, certainly that's not what Christ would have done. And so when we pattern and we are his disciples, we're his followers, that we wouldn't want to do that to someone uh, either. And uh, on the point that you want to bring in the abuses of that, uh, when we do that, Mike Davis has a very good comment in the chat. Okay, there's good. Okay. Um, that's a good point. There, there's a stronger point but than simply saying common courtesy. <laughs> and I appreciate I, you bringing you know, that up. I, uh, let, let me see if I can illustrate it this way. Okay. You invite somebody over and you don't realize they're Muslim. And you serve pork. And they're offended. And, and, you know, I mean, you don't realize it until it's too late. You haven't sinned in that circumstance. No. You know, because, I mean, because you're, uh, uh, you know, you've tried to be a good host. I, I, I don't think you should, I don't think you should deliberately provoke those right. who are not believers, and and you know that. So. Right, and we, you know, I was talking about the, and this is what Paul's talking about. The instance of where you intentionally say, "I don't care what he feels, I'm going to do this anyway," you know. And you're talking about an accident, you know, unintentional. Yeah. Um, now there is a verse that we won't spend much time on right now because we're going to look at it here when we hit chapter ten. But over in First Corinthians chapter ten, there in verse twenty-five, there, and I'll bring this up on the chart. The Apostle Paul says, eat whatever sold in the meat market, asking no questions for conscience sake. Yeah. And it may be that some would hold the position that it's referring to the conscience of the meat seller and not one's own conscience. Um, and so that's that might be something to talk more about as we get to that point. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and I think that goes back to the idea, the point I was making about being a proper example to those who are outside. You know, you've got yeah. a sign. Uh, you've got a sign. Uh, leftover meat offered to Isaac, offered to Diana. <laughs> you know, you <laughs> yeah. know. I mean, I, you know, you, you got you got the sign there. Uh, partake. You know, you know, part, you know, partake of this. It was offered to Diana, therefore it's blessed. You've got that, or you've just got the you've just got the the butcher or whatever that he's he's selling he's selling the cooked meat and he's not advertising it one way or the other you know he's just he's not so, so advertising it as meat we're you know, probably to, going to have to wait till we get to chapter 10 to yeah. set that in context yes yep, yep, yep. would be my thought but, but I just I thought I'd throw it out there because that's what someone could turn to but we do need to you know like you said contextually examine that for sure All right, well let's go into kind of the question about this passage being abused, and we, we kind of teased it last week, and on the blog update that I put out yesterday, kind of did a little, another tease there with that. Um, I had a, I had a preacher say to me one time, and it it had to do with um, a, a funeral that was going to be held in, um, or the members or the family wanted to be held in the 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 meeting place, and I realize there's different uh, views on that regarding it. But anyway, his reason was very simply, well, we're not going to do it because it offends me. And he, he's not the type of individual to violate his conscience. So that's not the application that he had intended. It's just that it just really bothers me if you do that, and so I'm not going to, uh, you know, you can't do that. And so... Can this, ver can this passage be applied to, well, it bothers me when you do that, so please don't do that, or is to offend much more than simply to irritate or to bother? And as we've already talked about, the, the idea of one stumbling because of the weak conscience is engaging in sin. It is that they do that which they believe to be wrong. And, and to, to use this as a weapon to get your way, you can't, pe you can't paint the building blue because that offends me. You can't hang those type of lights. That offends me. You can't cut your sermon five minutes short or go 15 minutes long because it offends me. I mean, that's, 
it is an abuse of, of this passage. Right, yeah. I yeah. would agree with you, uh, John, and when you look at verse 11, the word that's used is when it talks about this offense that takes place is the word stumble. Uh, yes. It, it trips him up. Uh, he he uh, misses the mark. He sins because of what you have done. Uh, I've, I'm not real sympathetic toward those who say that bothers me. Or they, or when they say that offends me, what they mean is, uh, I don't like it. Uh, right. But, and, but if they, they say that by doing that is going to put a stumbling block before me, now then we have an issue to deal yeah. with. But and, uh, most and times the it's not. I'm sorry, Paul, but the, the, the problem isn't that someone may not like it. The problem is when someone says, look, Romans 14 says, you're not supposed to offend me, and therefore you can't do it. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, and and I would also say that there's, there's a, there's a difference between somebody that maybe you do something one time and they become yeah. offended because of it. You know, you, you go back to the attitude when you love your brother, you're not going to want to deliberately do that. But you have some people who they are that way. And by the way, Mike Davis, his comment yeah. actually deals specifically with yeah. this. And and there are there are people who are contentious that no matter what you do and unless you do it the exact way that they want it done, they're gonna they're gonna pull the offend card. Yeah. You know, the um, I'm offended card, and they're gonna use it against you. And and I absolutely agree. As you were gonna read this comment here, you gotta back them down because they will run a church and they will destroy a church if you let them. Paul, I apologize. I wasn't pointing at you. It was the the, the emphasis, you know, of the of the uh, of the person who was misusing it. No, no, no I understand. <laughs> and uh, in in this chat, we're going to look at it in a moment. Uh, there's going to be a distinction there between a weak and an immature brother. And I just would like to say that as we read that, immature doesn't necessarily mean someone who's not been a Christian for a lot of years. Uh, right. Because sometimes I've heard people who were uh, as they say, seasoned citizens uh, who um, will throw this out. That bothers me. That that offends me. You can't do that because of this. But uh, I apologize. Go ahead. No, would you like to bring in uh, Mike's uh, comment now, Paul? Be happy to do that. Uh, he says sometimes the weak brother is the one who simply does not wish to become strong, but rather remain in his or her obtained traditions, convictions. If this is the case, then the weak become the manipulators. And he says, neither uh, strong nor weak, but manipulative in their action. The truly strong must back them down and prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. And I, I would agree with that. If we continue to read down there a little bit, uh, Brian Haynes says, uh, Mike agreed with me on a previous point, but he says, Marion Haynes says there, perhaps what needs to be discerned is the difference between the immature brother and the weak brother. I think that's a good way of saying that. We yield to the weak, but not to the immature. And Brian gives us a couple of references there in 1 Corinthians 3 and Hebrews 5 uh, that we, uh, that immaturity needs to be corrected. A uh, weakness needs to be strengthened. Certainly that's right, but they're not the same thing. That's right, and I think that's that is an outs outstanding point of clarification, outstanding mm -hmm. point. Um, and and you know, and there there are times where someone, for instance, let me give you a, a, another example. There might be a song in the songbook that I know that brother so and so or sister so and so just cannot sing, and the song in and of itself, you know, may not the song in and of itself is not unscriptural. But because of the wording, but because of um, the, the the movement in it, for whatever reason, they just can't sing that song. Now they haven't come up to me and the elders and said, "Look, we can no longer sing this song. If we do, I'm out of here." But they've expressed their concerns to me and say, "I'm not going to bind it on anybody." Now, if I lead singing. I should really kind of take that into thought and say, you know, I'm not going to pick a song out that my brother or sister is unable to sing because of their conscience. Mm -hmm. I'm going to find some other songs to sing. Now, in that case, they're not using it to control the congregation and have their way, and we should think about our brethren in that instance. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the immaturity that, that Mike so well brought up and that Brian is talking about as well is a Christian who's behaving immature. Uh, not simply weak, but but immature, and um, 
very very good point about making that distinction there. Right. Yeah. Now, uh, let me make one observation about all of this. The challenge, the challenge that we have in all of this is where do we draw the line? You know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, and honestly, and and I I honestly mean that because I mean it. It's a problem. It's a problem. Where do we draw the line? There are some who are more dogmatic than others, you know, in dealing with these things. There, there are um, there are some who demand their way. Yeah. Uh, and and you've got you've got to deal with you've got to deal with the conscience, and you've got to deal with not being offensive just for the sake of being offensive. Yeah. But, but you've well, got to make the determination. How far can how far do we go where we Bend over backwards for somebody, uh, which there are circumstances we ought to do that, but at other times say no, I'm not going to do that. It's not productive. I would say that the uh, the limit, uh, I don't know where that is, but the limit is uh, very extreme. And the reason I say that is because Paul says that if meat, I mean if that's what we're going to discuss. Meat, if meat makes my brother stumble. Then I'll never eat it again. Right, exactly. But in in that application, Paul knows genuinely that it causes the brother to stumble. It's not a, a manipulative tactic. Yeah, exactly. No, and, it, and it's not he just a bothersome thing. Yeah, exactly. He knows the background. He knows the struggle, uh, and all those circumstances. And and that's why he says, you know what? I, I'm not going to run somebody off. Right. You know, a, a weak brother who is striving to do the right thing. I'm not going to run him off just because I want to have my way and I want to be able to eat my right. pork sandwich. Yeah. You know, I, as an example. You know. the, to, to me, the challenge would be on the part of elders, um, and it's even a greater challenge if you have no elders and you, ha you have to resort to business meetings. But in, and, and now we're, talk, we're going back to the, the abuse where someone doesn't like what's happening, not an actual matter of them sinning or, or being, being caused to stumble, is trying to draw the line, and this goes back to what you're saying. If, if the eldership, every time someone comes up and says, you know, I, I don't really like this song, could we consider not singing it because of these words? If the elders always say, nope, we make the decisions, we see it fine, run long, don't bother us, then you got a problem. Yes. But if you have elders that every single time someone comes up and says, I don't like this, I don't like that, and they begin to, to give in to everyone, then you have a situation of manipulation that can develop. And, and I think, and then you have to ask yourself, and tell me, where's the limit on this? Is it hurting the work of the church? Mm -hmm. Is it creating um, preferential treatment within the congregation? Is it showing a respect or being a respecter of persons? Um, I, I think those questions need to be asked. Is the person genuine, or are they just wanting to have things their way? You have to kind of weigh all the all all those questions there. Yeah, and 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 it's an absolute challenge that requires maturity. Now, yes. uh, and and let me let me tell you this: What happens when no matter what decision you make, you're going to offend somebody? Well, <laughs> you know, it's, it's like don't forget like that the thermostat. <laughs> Who yeah. can find the yeah. perfect setting for the thermostat? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. There, there's some things, no matter what you do, yeah. somebody's not going to like your decision. And yeah. and and the th the thermostat's the trivial one. You know, you know, you know. I yeah. mean, there are times that elders have to make decisions that are going to affect real lives in a congregation, and no matter what decision they make, somebody's not going to like it. Well. Yeah. We're, where to relocate the building? You're gonna have. We're in the need of building a new building. We're gonna buy some land. Where do we buy the land? You know, are we gonna use pews or are we gonna buy pew chairs that interlock? Yeah. How are we gonna borrow the money? Exactly. I mean, there, there's so many different things there. Um, the reason why I use the thermostat is, is it, it, to me, while it's trivial, it is a great example. You can have one person say, come up and say, listen, it's always too cold in here. Y'all need to turn it up. So the elders say, oh, okay, we'll go up two degrees. Then they get five women come and say, look, you got to turn it back down. We're too hot. You know, and they turn it back down. And then that woman comes back. No, I thought you said you were going to turn it back up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
tossed to know, and fro, carried about by every yeah, wind you, of the air conditioner. Yeah, it, you've got, and, and, and I, write, I agree, it is trivial, but it does, yeah. it, 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 it typifies exactly what happens oftentimes, but on greater issues, you know. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and just the point, and I know I'm redundant in saying this, but the point is, is it's not easy. It's not easy making these decisions because uh, a, lo a lot of these little things like this are not clear cut. That's I'm, right. not, I'm not sure if we clearly define here that uh, the offending is to cause to sin. Um, I, I'm not sure if there's all that many. Now, now, if you talk about the people who throw that out, throw that argument out, yes, you, you'll have uh, multitudes of them. Mm -hmm. but if you break it down into biblical terms mm -hmm. and for, for elders or for a congregation or whoever it is and say, well, who am I really causing to sin by what I do? Uh, I think that will minimize uh, the right. difficulties of those decisions. Oh, abs absolutely. And, and, and there's, there's rules that you go by. You know, when I, when I preached a series of lessons a few years ago on division, one of the points that I made are on unity is wherever division exists, I will guarantee you 100% of the time, somebody does not have a proper attitude where God's Word is concerned. Typically, or there, there, are, usually, there are instances where nobody has a proper attitude, <laughs> but somebody either doesn't love God the way that they ought to, they don't love their brethren the way that they ought to, uh, and or so on and so forth, and that's why it leads to a division. Well, let me let me say something about what, Paul. What what you just said, and I think this is a good point of clarification. If you're serving as an eldership, or you're having men's business meeting, and someone comes up and says, "Look, y'all can't. We need to stop doing this because it offends me." Romans 14 and 1 Corinthians 8 says, "I think the elders at that point need to say, no, those passages don't apply in this situation." Now, if you just don't like it, we'll take that under advisement. You know what I'm saying? You know, they, they have to make certain that they don't let others use those passages outside of the biblical context. And that's what you're talking about, Paul. I think so, yeah. yeah. Right, yeah. I, that's why I perceived it. I'm not telling you what you're talking about. <laughs> no, I, didn't I don't take it that way. Uh, and I, I agree with you, John, that, that uh, there just needs to be a distinction. It's not that... Uh, by the way, not uh, those who lead, those who shepherd, uh, is not that they behave in such a way that they have disregard for the feelings right. or the uh, the uh, concerns, uh, uh, right. the things that may bother uh, a person. But uh, don't don't let them pull in these passages and say uh, you have to make a change because that offends me. When all it really does is bother them. Yeah, yeah, uh, and and if I can give a real quick illustration of this, you know, I just kind of thought about this. Um, you know, sometimes people, when they say the prayer for the bread of the Lord's Supper, they will say something to the effect of, uh, 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 "This is in remembrance of your body, which was broken for us." And there are some who become offended at using the term "broken." You know, because you've got the passage, not a bone was broken, but yet his body was broken down. So how do you deal with a circumstance like that to make every, or from a proper attitude standpoint? My answer, if I were given that as an illustration, would be if you're leading a prayer, being aware of the conscience of your brother, because it's, it's not something that you ought to be contentious about, you try to avoid using the expression broken. But at the same time, if you're the brother who struggles with that, realize that it's a ma that there is a sense in which it could be used. And so if another brother does that, just have the attitude, he meant it the right way. So in, in other words, either way, you're trying to work with each other. And you have a proper attitude. And when everybody has the proper attitude, we can work through these things. Yeah. Or take him to 1 Corinthians 11, 24, where Paul says that Jesus says, Take, eat, this is my body which was broken for you. Yeah. Do this in remembrance of me. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. And I know the passion. I, I, and, and that's why I use the illustration. It yeah. can be argued both ways. Yeah, exactly. 
yeah. you know, what is the intent of the expression broken? Yeah. And, and, and so I use that as an illustration. And, and my point is, is to avoid contention. If yeah. you personally don't prefer it, you know, just assume, well, he doesn't mean it in a negative way. Or he doesn't mean it as if to say his bones were broken. And as a brother, if I were leading that prayer, I, am, I try not to use that expression because it concerns other brethren. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. To me, to me, it's just it's it's language. I, you know, to me, it's more clear to say this bread represents the body of your son, which died upon the cross. I mean, or nailed to the cross. Yeah. yeah. You I avoid mean, you avoid the conflict in that circumstance. Yeah. If you know it's going to bother someone. Exactly. Um, when we live, we lived down in Lawton. There was a, a gentleman who in his prayer uh, raised the eyebrows of a couple of members as well as a visitor one time because he did not say in Jesus name amen when he got to the end of the prayer and thanking the father for this and that and you know for sending a son and all that and for saving us he said amen and I explained to him I said you know nowhere in the Bible does it say we have to say we have to take the wording in Jesus name we pray amen we understand that we pray to God through the authority of Jesus Christ. It doesn't have to be worded. It's not like putting a stamp on the prayer so that God will accept it. But, and they, they, they listened and they, they agreed and they understood that. But if you have someone who just, though that's the way they see it, then I think all men who are aware of the situation should take that in, in mind and consideration. Yeah, yeah, yeah ex exactly. And, and and that's a part of looking at you. And again, we'll get more into that in chapter 10 too. But yeah. but he makes the point here though, you know, if, if, if it makes my brother stumble, I'll never again eat meat. Exactly. And that's that's the point. If everyone has the proper love and respect and, 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 and desire for unity within a congregation, then these problems will they won't be problems. Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and chances are that that discussion that we just had, that's not this contentious brother that comes along and says with every little thing, I'm offended. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. All righty. Well, gentlemen, we have we've come to the end of Chapter 8. Um, chapter 8 was pretty simple. There wasn't much more that needed to be talked about, I didn't think. Did we overlook something that was crucial? I don't think so. I think, uh, in my view, we're ready to proceed to chapter 9, verse 1, starting okay. next time. Yeah. D just remember verse number 12. I just mentioned this. Uh, when you sin against your brother and wound them, you're also sinning against Christ. That's right. That's exactly right. That is exactly right. Well, then let's play it next Wednesday, Lord, uh, Lord willing, without the technical glitches and with Daniel back with us, Lord willing. Let's plan to pick up again in verse, well, in chapter 9, verse 1. That sounds good? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Daniel was going to join us today at 6 o'clock Hawaii time. However, he had to go pick his car up at 7 o'clock. And as, is, as he explained it to us, it is a on a scheduled basis. And so his ride was coming to get him at around 6 and taking him to get the car. So that's why he was unable to be with us today. So, Lord willing, we will see him next Wednesday as we continue here with 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Uh, any final thoughts or comments? Paul, let's start with you. We're certainly thankful that every person joined us today and those who may watch this at a later date as well. And I just uh, invite you to ask us any questions that you might have, questions at truthfactor.com or Paul, uh, John, Tom at truthfactor.com. You can email us individually. And we'll be happy to try to address whatever you bring forth. See you next time. Mm -hmm. Tom, any thoughts? Uh, thank you for your good comments. Uh, again, I'm honored to be a part of this study. Um, look forward to our continued studies uh, next week. All righty. Same here. Thank you so much for joining us this week as we factor the truth of God's Word into our daily lives. If you're watching this after the study, and you have a question about something that we've said, as Paul said, don't hesitate to write us. Send your questions and comments directly to questions at truthfactor.com or write each of us individually. We'll be more than happy to get back with you and study with you more on the matter. Thank you so much. And Lord willing, we'll see you back here again next Wednesday at 11 o'clock Central Time. That's noon Eastern Time. 
9 o'clock Pacific Time. Right here at live.truthfactor.com. Have a wonderful week.